Jenny. We make jokes all the time. We play games all the time. And we love to play the guitar. Lots of friends. He, he was just a special kid. He was so smart. In 1992, a 20-year-old Carl Dean Sampson was tried and convicted of murdering his mother's husband. The jury never learned of his deep psychological history. So they made a verdict based on lack of information and important evidence. Carl was sentenced to a life without parole. And so things seem to start changing um, later in his, his younger years. What, what happened? What, 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 what really started happening? Well, me and Arnold Dean, the defendant, moved to California in 1988. We got married and we had both of the boys with us. Carl graduated high school at that time. We decided we were gonna come back to Oklahoma and get our stuff and move to California. But we decided instead that we wanted to stay in Oklahoma. So we went back and told the kids that we were gonna come back to Oklahoma and that they were more than welcome to come back with us at that time if they wanted to. But they didn't want to come back to Oklahoma, so they decided to stay in California on their own. And Billy got with Jennifer, my daughter-in-law, and they had a child. And Billy was at work, my other son. And Jennifer went in to take care of the child from his nap and found that he was not breathing brought him out, handed him to Carl, and asked Carl to help him. And that child passed away at six weeks old. And that's when it all started. Something had changed in him. And so that, that kind of creates like some sort of spiral for him and you start really getting into it even more heavily based off of that? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I know it's kind of painful. He was different. He was completely different. Um, it has changed him. Um, he was more aggressive and just different. Um, we would spend hours at night because unfortunately we were on meth <clears throat> talking all night about uh, disciples. Yeah, because he went out into the field over at my dad's house and was rummaging around out there thinking that he was not necessarily God but God's disciple or whatever. And like Jesus type thing. And that's when we got him into Benita uh, Institution for help. And they diagnosed him as paranoid schizophrenic. Because I had just lost my son, he just lost his grandpa. And uh, things were spiraling. Um, he was starting to do stuff. I uh, had a collection of knives at one time. <laughs> that he unlocked and start um, throwing, throwing him things. Um, he started throwing fits. He had never been that way before, ever, ever, ever. He was the most kindest person ever. Um, and you said that in 1990, yes. uh, before all this happened. Before all this happened. That he had been 
taken to the hospitals a couple times for yes. assessment. So um, when you initially then, went there, what what was their evaluation of them? A paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah. They, uh, I went and picked them up in October before this, about 15 days before this happened. They called me and asked 19, me. Uh, 1990. In 1990. Mm -hmm. 1991. Yeah. They called me and asked if they could come down to Oklahoma. So I drove down there and I picked Within them all two up. Weeks. And I was driving back and we got to like the Mojave Desert and I had to stop and rest because I was tired. So we pulled over to a, a rest stop and I was going to get out and stretch my legs and, and Carl got out of the car and he was saying stuff like, you're just taking me back to Oklahoma so people could F me. And you don't want, you don't, you just want everyone to be able to F me. And then he took off into the desert and ripped it ripped up all his money. Ripped up all of his money, threw his wallet away and his ID. And it took, I had to call 911 for rescue. They had helicopters out looking for him and he like spent three hours into the desert before he ever come out the other side. Yeah. We got back in, and I tried to get them to extradite him back to Benita. Because he had already been and diagnosed. They wouldn't. So. they wouldn't. They said he's safe with, in, my, in my hands. So they put him back with me. We, we got back in the car. Days. And we come back to Oklahoma. And the day that all this stuff happened, the cops were at my house asking me to come to town and pick Carl up because he was scaring people in town. I told him, I says, there's nothing I can do. He's of age. If he won't come with me, which I know he won't, he's psychotic. He was 20 years at the time. Yeah. Years old. He's psychotic. Uh, he won't pay attention to me. I can't understand half of what he's saying. So, now we're up to the moment that all this really started happening. Can you explain to me, kind of step by step, yeah. what happened? Arnie and I was there already in bed asleep. We got back to the house and um, I had went to the bathroom and Carl, Billy, and I had walked into the house. Um, I had come out of the bathroom and Billy had met me in the hallway where her bedroom was and told me to go out to the shed where we had lived. And um, um, it was probably 10 minutes later and all the cops were there and they had surrounded the house. Carl had come out with his hands on his head and yelling, I had um, Do? I had an eye mask on because my right eye is damaged and I couldn't close it at the time so I had a full eye mask on but I woke up just as soon as the water bed started moving to see the knife come down on his chest he had stabbed my father in the heart Arnie didn't make it to the life leg. And so, uh, did all this, this this event seem to be uncommon for Very Carl? uncommon. Yeah, absolutely. He was not just right mind. He was such a talented, loving person before. But at the time, his eyes were just like black. He looked like Charles Manson. He did look like Charles Manson. The picture that they put on the on newspaper. the newspaper. I mean, he's just such crazy. His eyes are so hollow. Yeah, he's Blank. completely different. And I mean, it's not like this is something that I mean, the action was probably really surprising for you guys. But it seems like the sickness that led him to do this. I mean, a lot of it had been known by the yes. medicals, medical facilities. They did, but we didn't. Well, we, did, we did. did. Yeah. I mean, I knew he was mentally ill, but by that time he was of age and, and parents can't just... Yeah, we didn't know the definition of schizophrenia at the time.
He was on medication. He went off of his medication. Yes. I gave all the medication to the police that he had been supposed to be put on. I gave all the medications to the police. None of that was brought up. Explain to me kind of what they kind of did in regards to him being represented and how, I mean, well, they gave what him led a, up to this and how that was being represented in the actual They uh, gave case. him a court-appointed lawyer. Tony Lyons. Tony Lyons, which has passed away by now. Well, we know that. So is the uh, judge. I told him and I told Tony McBride that, you know, he was mentally ill and that he had been on medication and he'd stopped taking his medication. And from there, they did uh, send him to Eastern State Oklahoma again to evaluate him. Third time? Second time. Or, uh, we call it. An evaluation to see if he was competent enough to stand trial. Defendant is unable to understand the nature and seriousness of the charges against him. Defendant is unable to aid and assist in his own defense. Defendant is out of reach with reality, makes impulsive statements. My personal but unqualified diagnosis is that he is extremely paranoid and schizophrenic. And I've got statements from Eastern State, Oklahoma, the psychiatrist. Pursuit to your orders of November 6, 1991, I have examined the above named patient and made the following determination. In this, this is person able is this person able to appreciate the nature of the changes charges against him answer no mr sampson is in extremely paranoid and schizophrenic if the answer to question one or two is no can the person attend competency within a reasonable time if provided with a course of treatment therapy or training Yes, Mr. Sampson is regarded a amendable to neurological and physiological intervention. He got none of the treatment that he was supposed to get. And this is all pre-trial. This is all. This is all pre-trial. Pre-trial. And so they, so they were aware of they were. his psychological situation. Yes. They diagnosed the him police, a few times. Even the sheriff. At what point did they bring that to the awareness of the jury itself? They didn't. Out of these letters, the judge got to hear about it, but the judge did not instruct for the jury to hear about it. So the jury did not hear about any of this encompassing. And did they explain why? No. No. They closed down the mental part shortly after he got there. And then they just put him out into the, the public. He has spent 28 years incarcerated for something he was not mentally incompetent. Mentally incompetent. Now, here's the difficult part, is the fact that he had killed your husband. Yes. And 28 years later... I'm trying to get him out. He's, your husband's still dead, and you're trying to get your child But I not out. only lost my husband, I lost my son at the same time. And I know he was mentally incompetent, to stand trial and I do understand he needed to be punished but life without parole more people have done worse and what kind of 
I mean, how do you, I mean, what kind of forgiveness do you have for him right now? Do you have forgiven him? I have forgiven him. Yes, he's my son. I love him. I told him years and years ago, there's nothing you can do that I will not forgive. I just didn't know it was going to be this hard. But yes, I have forgiven him. He has done his duty. I mean, my brother got shot four times in the back and that guy didn't get the 20 years, it's been seven. He wasn't mentally ill. My son being mentally ill and they give him life without parole. It's not right. They say that he deserves a second chance. That he, he needs the commutation. He needs to be able to get out and be with his family. I need him. I mean, apparently he wasn't properly represented with his, his mental situation. It was not provided to the jury to be able to truly give him, you know, the case that should have happened. And that could have created some sort of leniency on, you know, his, his, his case. You know, he should, not being in uh, prison for 28 years without parole, without any uh, type of real medical assistance, psychological assistance. He was not represented the right way. And so all that time, there's a lot that he's lost. He's missed out on. He, kind of, he has lost a lot even in there. It took him years before he ever came to his senses to be himself again. He's missed out on his, his uh, nephews, niece growing up, he has missed out on Frank, his great nephews, nephews. nephews, and this is only two of them, he has four, but he's missed out on all of that, he's, <laughs> he has missed out on everything that life gives him, and these, these are precious, look how many you guys are. <laughs> They are precious, and he needs to be able to know them and them know him. Yes. I, I am the victim, the victim's wife. I am also his mother, and I forgive him. He, I would let him live back in my house at any time right now. He's back to himself. I know. I'm his mother. I've been there. I visit him. I know that he's not talking nonsense anymore. He's back. And he needs able to get out. And be with these guys. Yeah. Be with us. Be with his family. Be with his brother. That's what I want. I want him out before I die.